The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and happy, happy World FM Day to everyone. My name is Sade Indubinen and I am IFMA's membership assistant. I want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us today for the member benefit of the month, Smart Cities, the Internet of Buildings, brought to you by Facility Management Consulting Council, or FMCC. Please be aware that you are all muted to prevent background noise during this time. IFMA's Member Benefit of the Month series is put in place to further enhance your membership experience. Each month you will receive a message with an exclusive benefit or opportunity created just for you, our IFMA members. As the facility management industry evolves, it is crucial that you stay aware of best practices um, and aware of trends and other developments affecting the profession. IFMA wants to be there for you by offering exclusive access to valuable resources that set you apart from your fellow professionals. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the chat box. If time permits, there will be a Q&A session at the, at the end of the presentation. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. Therefore, a recording as well as a copy of the presentation will be emailed to you. The ISO Technical Committee 267 for Facility Managers is developing international standards to bring together the FM community worldwide to speak one language. To date, there are three published standards and a technical report, and this is a big deal for facility managers, especially with the publication of the ISO 410. One, which provides a roadmap for aligning FM to the core business strategy requirements and will enable organizations worldwide to review and recognize these practices and deliver a true facility management support service. If you have any questions, you can reach out to Laverne. Her email address is on the slide. Please be aware of all of the IFMA councils and communities that you are able to join. And you will also see the FMCC vision and mission. A shout out to our FMCC sponsors. And I will now be passing the presentation over to Mohammed, who will be presenting our presenter today. Oh, thank you, Sidi, for your introduction. Um, and uh, to everybody, uh, hello. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on your time zone. Uh, I'm talking to you from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. It's like uh, 1,000 kilometers from Jeddah Economic Tower, uh, one of the marvelous projects that we're gonna talk to you about after a while. Um, our uh, presentation that will be delivered by Paul is uh, talking about master planning, smart cities, and city building. Uh, it's, uh, of course, a very important uh, subject that combine the uh, sustainability with the facility management and using the internet for building uh, favors. Uh, of course, it's uh, uh, maybe a challenging uh, um, industry uh, in some areas, but it's a booming in other areas. I hope I will illustrate these things for you and uh, I'm not uh, going to take a lot of uh, time leaving uh, Paul to have the floor. And I thank him for a very um, fantastic journey that he did yesterday and today to come to you and uh, give you this kind of uh, presentation. Hope you enjoy it and uh, I hope you all wish you a great uh, facility management day for the 2018. Paul. 
Thank you very much, Doctor. And uh, just wanted to wish you personally a uh, Mohammed on Mubarak, and also uh, greetings to everyone here. I will have to apologize ahead of time if there is noise in the background. I'm going to try and limit that as much as possible. As uh, as Mohammed just mentioned, uh, it's been a challenge sometimes to actually find where I could sit down to give this presentation, but I was looking forward to this only because of the importance of the subject matter. Uh, my name is Paul, and I'm an architect, but I'm also a builder and a real estate developer and uh, have been involved with uh, IFMA now for, oh geez, almost uh, 28 years. Uh, the importance of the association is really about, uh, you know, the, the idea of the maturation of the profession, um, because it is becoming more and more apparent that as we start moving forward as industries, meaning the technology industries, the, the real estate industries, there's a convergence happening. And what this presentation is going to be uh, explaining is our viewpoint of where those collisions are happening. Now, collisions don't have to be violent. Uh, they can actually be wonderful destructors. Uh, and we're gonna be showing some and showcasing some of the needs that we're seeing in the marketplace, um, which uh, will have a direct effect on, on the profession of how we receive our capital projects um, and also then how do we operate these projects, especially as they're becoming more and more high performance and what do we need to start doing to position ourselves for success? So with, with that, let me um, uh, start this presentation with a little bit about the background so you can get the context. Um, TDG or the Digit Group, uh, we do, uh, we are an at-risk uh, real estate developer on most of our projects. We're also for fee on others. Um, we are setting standards out there that we are learning uh, through the associations of working with governments. Um, this is really a top-down and a bottom-up type of exercise. Um, if you can imagine brand new cities from scratch or definitely not for the faint-hearted, but what we feel is that there's a, a, a real need out there to start the contextualization of what things like the Internet of Things are all about and big data and all those big words. Um, you know, and then of course we have, you know, the building information modeling piece that we get from our, uh, you know, vendors and, and consultants, like our architects, our engineers, our contractors. Um, and what, what I've been seeing over the past few years is that there's a lot of really good innovation happening. There's some nice examples of what's happening, but what we didn't see was a movement. And what that means is that the market pulling for a lot of, uh, you know, this innovation. So what we decided to do uh, was that we were tool makers for many, many years. Uh, if you've ever heard of a technology called Tririga, uh, we were part of that. Uh, uh, if you've heard of a technology called Reddit by Autodesk, uh, we were part of that. Uh, Buzzsaw, we were part of that. So we were very good with creating tools for the profession to use. Um, but what we found was that the needle really wasn't moving as fast as we wanted. So about seven years ago, we decided to use our own tools that we were developing only for us and not sell it to the outside world and show how we can do things differently disrupt. And we were very fortunate uh, to get the eye of a lot of leadership, including the United States government, the Chinese government, as you see in the photograph on this slide. Uh, we are working very closely with uh, the leadership over in Saudi Arabia and in the United Arab Emirates. And as of a week ago Tuesday, uh, we are also now working uh, very hard here in the United States of America. So we have a good footprint. Um, as you'll see here, of projects uh, that are coming up and operational. Uh, we do have shovels in the ground now on four of our projects. Uh, one of the projects is actually being pulled up. We're up over 60 stories right now. The world's tallest building is being built just outside of Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. <coughs> so the reason why I wanted to show this is that this is no longer PowerPoint. It's no longer great ideas. Uh, there's a lot of money at stake here and also policy of how we're starting to take a look at buildings in, in ways that we haven't before. Uh, meaning, like when I was growing up in school, everything was about building as machine. And uh, I, feel, I feel like that that's wrong now. I, you know, it's not about the machine. It's more about how a building can integrate into, as an organism so that it works as an ecosystem. And when we start to take a look at that, we have to take a look at innovation. Because a lot of times you hear the word smart cities, you think, oh, it's all about technology, and it's not. Um, it's really about the art of the possible. Uh, it's this, uh, you know, it's this new way of of taking uh, innovations and combining them together to come up with with, with amazing results. But it's all going to be based upon what we call the ten guiding principles of smart cities. This is not in any order. 
but there's always an energy component. Uh, there's always an IT or ICT component, uh, transportation, uh, public safety, security, water, waste. Uh, all these things make up urban environments today. What we're seeing is that there's the ability for us to take this laundry list of principles and be able to reprioritize those based upon innovations that will help that particular location in an urban environment. Because even in one city today, like, like let's take an existing city like San Francisco, uh, you know, there's certain areas that have a higher priority on education, while others is more about public safety and security. So you have to be creative in how you start to put together these, these, these innovations that we like to think of them as ingredients inside of a kitchen. And we really consider ourselves as chefs that create recipes that are the right solutions at that moment in time. So that's why when we take a look at innovations, we really are taking, uh, you know, the literal, uh, you know, uh, way of, of writing the cookbook. Uh, because if you don't have that playbook, you're going to be wasting resources doing it again and again and again when it's, it should be done once and then shared. That's the reason why I wanted to be able to uh, use World FM Day to share and, and let everyone know, here's the secret sauce of how all this works. Um, and let's show you one recipe, and maybe uh, it would be a good example. Um, we Let's start with energy first. Uh, that seems to be something that is on everyone's hot list, uh, especially in the built environment. Uh, we've been working with the Georgia Tech Research Institute, GTRI, in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, for a number of years now concerning the research and development of a technology that's based upon kinetic energy. Kinetic energy has two major forms of how you can create um, energy, and one is from compression, uh, known as piezoelectric. There's also friction, known as triboelectric. Now, what happens is when you have materials that are compressed, because we'll focus on, on that one, um, we, we found that different materials respond in different ways. You could be walking, running, riding a bicycle, being in a bus, being in a car. And what happens is that weight of, of that movement excites the molecules inside of certain pieces of material that we can harvest that energy. In the past, we used to have to harvest it in batteries, and it was a very laborious type of way of moving about <coughs> and starting to capture an energy and then distribute it right, for use. Um, but what we found a couple of years ago uh, through a company called Qualcomm in San Diego, uh, they have a technology called Halo that allows you to take that, that energy and immediately wirelessly distributed. So imagine the dynamic charging that can happen as you're walking, like let's say through an office space. And as you're walking, all of your devices on your person are always 100% battery uh, uh, you know, charged. Uh, we can also keep the lights on. We have the ability now, now to keep uh, equipment, uh, appliances, all these different things inside of the building operational through power just by movement. The other way we've been using this is also outside. Uh, and this can be underneath as a substrate of rubber, asphalt, concrete, that type of thing. And we're able now to uh, uh, use the, that energy that's created even with heavier vehicles, like let's say a public bus, to actually keep that bus operational and charged. So it's a huge breakthrough. It's a different way of looking at energy. Uh, where we have installed this um, is over uh, in uh, the Atlanta Hartsfield Airport. Uh, you can see a quick video of a gentleman that is uh, jump, jumping up and down on the carpet that has piezo underneath it. Um, we put this at the TSA security lines at the airport, and over 500,000 people have used it to create uh, the uh, a, a selfie because you're able to take enough energy by movement to actually then see uh, that you can. Well, it's a behavior change, right, where, where you can actually see that your movement is creating enough power to take a selfie, and then you're able to push that selfie back up to Facebook or Instagram, and like I said, we've had over 500,000 users just just be able to show that type of behavior change. In the right upper right-hand corner, uh, we do have the world's largest installation of outdoor piezoelectric, uh, which is at the Kennedy Space Center. It's the visitor center uh, at Cape Canaveral. Uh, it is a remarkable uh, achievement achievement and the amount of energy that's created in order to entertain and educate folks about space travel. Uh, in the lower right-hand corner, we have another installation uh, with Mercedes-Benz Arena in Atlanta. Uh, the idea here is to put it into the concourse so that as you're going to get food, as you're going to, uh, you know, to restrooms, that type of thing during a sporting event or an entertainment event, uh, you'd be able then to keep the lights on 
inside of the concourse or keep the popcorn maker going, that type of thing. So these are small experiments that are now starting to uh, allow people to start to dream a little bit about what this can really mean. The way that we've used it is that we're installing it inside the tires of our electric vehicles, which means that we have the ability now to not just have like the roadbed create enough energy. We're actually doing this now with, with, with buses in, in the public realm. Uh, this is our first prototype. I'll be showing you what our latest prototype is in about 20 minutes or so. But this particular prototype is, is pretty remarkable on a couple of different scales. Uh, number one, um, it's an EV, it's an electric vehicle, but it's also autonomous, means it's self-driving. It self-drives itself to very specific spots, meaning bus stops. We know that between the the, uh, it, the, the ability to put piezo into the roadbed 100 yards before the pull off into the bus stop, and then another 100 yards upon leaving and exiting that particular bus stop, along with the piezoelectric that is being compressed inside of the tires, and then wirelessly uh, being able to drive that motor, uh, we are creating excess energy, meaning that we have enough energy to keep the uh, to, to keep it going uh, from bus stop to bus stop. But once it stops at the bus stop, the bus stops are also now taking that wireless charge and then there being the transformer to actually then push that energy back into the grid, selling it back to the power company. It's a remarkable it's a remarkable way of being able to keep uh, public uh, public transportation in forms of uh, EV buses uh, uh, free. The other thing that we're able to do, again, as a, and so that's the second uh, ingredient or innovation inside of our recipes. The third one has to do with safety and security, and that's about the lighting of the streets that these buses drive on. And we use LED lights uh, for obvious reasons. You know, it's uh, more efficient, more effective, cost of, you know, costs a lot less. It's all those good things. But what's interesting is that the LED light spectrum it 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 is uh, it operates at such a rate that the the actual light uh, that comes out of the lamps can create a uh, can create the environment for internet protocol to run on top of it throughout the streets. And right now we have an up down uh, speed of 10G based on a technology called Sensity. Uh, it's uh, right here in the U.S. It's uh, it's being sold through Verizon. Uh, but we're also seeing this uh, with other types of, uh, again, of of capturing uh, the internet uh, protocol waves. Uh, we're starting to see other uh, vendors come out uh, beyond Sensity to, that, that's actually implementing this. So think about this ecosystem. You have energy generation just by movement. Uh, you have energy distribution that's done wirelessly and dynamic. You have a free public transportation system because you're creating positive carbon enough energy then to sell back into the grid and it you know having a safe and secure ride because the lighting is great but that lighting is also providing an up down 10g li-fi hotspot so it's a pretty remarkable way of putting together different types of innovations that work together as an organism that's really the big uh, you know story here is that it's never just one innovation or one technology technology is how you start to interrelate those because it's never about the node it's going to be always about the connection right so that's that's the way that we're seeing at least one of the recipes of thousands that we're being exposed to every day and then how do you put that into the public realm so that urban dwellers will benefit from that uh, you know in this particular recipe there's a lot of benefits you know from uh, you know transportation to safety to uh, clean energy um, and also speeds that will help things like safety and security because that 10G up-down link uh, is now what the first responders use in all of our urban environments. So we're, we're creating a, a, a different type of approach to what people call infrastructure. Um, and that is, uh, again, just one of our, uh, one of our ways of, uh, of coming up with these different types of, of urban experiences. Um, where we really start with all this, though, uh, really comes from the consultants that that uh, that either you are on this call or that you hire, and we're doing it a little bit differently. Uh, we were uh, part of the original team that brought building information modeling to market. Uh, we had created a tool called Charles River Software, uh, and we renamed it Revit, uh, which is now uh, the number one BIM or building information modeling software in the world uh, by Autodesk. Okay. Um, we are tending to not look at the geometry as much as we're looking at the data. Now, a lot of people say that, 
and sometimes when you hear the word data, I know a lot of people's eyeballs roll in the back of their head. This is not anything different than, I'd rather call it information, where the information, when you put it together in such a way, we're creating the digital DNA of the built environment every time you hit the enter key when you're using an authoring tool like Revit. You're also creating the digital DNA of the built environment with other tools, it's like what we use to manage our facilities and operate our facilities, because it's a constant, never-ending change to the life of that building. The way that we look at our information is that uh, we like to see it as a, uh, as a starting point that actually starts to have a personality. And as you, as you analyze uh, the data, uh, you can actually see things, uh, like even the physical things, like movement of the building. Uh, there's ways of seeing the use of the building. Uh, or, or non-use. So what we're doing now is taking the approach that we would have a central, we would have a central BIM office uh, associated with every one of our capital projects that captures that data in, from, from the beginning in, in the project delivery process to be reused later. Now, I've seen a lot of presentations on BIM for FM and, it, you know, on the one-offs, it looks great, especially in, you know, you know, conferences like this or webinars or workplace, you know, places like that. But, you know, I almost have to, you know, ask the question, just because you can, should you? Um, you know, the ability to put a screw into a wall, you can do it with a hammer, but isn't a screwdriver easier? Right now, BIM is the big hammer, but not everything's a nail. Uh, and the way that the building information modeling is being used, especially the data creation side of things, um, it's a lot different from where we're using it three, you know, hopefully 30, 50 years into the future. I've not seen that done before. First of all, Ben has been around that long, so we can't actually have, you know, case studies to show that it does that. We can assume and we can aspire for a lot of this to happen. But, we're, we're, you know, a lot of this stuff is still aspirational in my mind. You know, I'm not seeing this huge movement where, you know, BIM is going to be this, you know, the next great thing. Actually, I don't think it is. BIM in its best is a good authoring tool. Um, how you manage that data through the life cycle of that building, though, is still our challenge. And we're seeing a lot of words like machine learning and blockchain and artificial intelligence and the internet of things and sensors. It's a lot of noise. There's some really important pieces that that are being able to, uh, you know, take that data and see it all the way through. Um, but what we're looking at now is maybe some ways of how we can take that data and get to some initial uh, applications and 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 get those baby steps in place so that we can learn over time and then analyze about how well that worked. And that's really the essence of smart cities because we're not talking about one building; we're talking about multiple buildings. It could be a district, it could be an entire sector, it can be the entire city itself, the entire urban environment. So when you, when you hear the word BIM, uh, we're taking a look at it not so much from the geometry and doing things in 3D, although that's cool. What we're looking at is actually the data and how we can actually flow that through in a critical path so that the originators, the authors of that data, may not be the stewards that see it all the way through, which is why this world of standards becomes a really, 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 really big deal. Because you can imagine that when I have a piece of information that I'm using to design and construct for project delivery, what's happening though, let's say five, six, ten years in the future, that same piece of data can be used for firefighters in our world. In smart cities, different people can use that data because it's going to help them get their job done better. And, and I mentioned firefighters were doing uh, and have had a great uh, uh, success uh, with Kansas City, Missouri Fire Department. Uh, and uh, working with their leadership, showing how the building department information and operations information can be used by firefighters before they get to an event, if there's an event that's called in on, like, let's say, the emergency network of 911. This is how important these things start to become, you know, building departments, uh, FM, uh, you know, O&M, all these types of pieces of data continue to be positioned somewhere on the planet Earth. That means that we are creating the digital equivalent of the planet Earth over time. And it's our job and our responsibility to, to make sure that that data is as accurate as possible. And we've done a pretty good job of that. And I know, you know, as FMers, uh, you know, you're usually pulling your hair out going, I've not seen a good as built, right? <laughs> because I know that VAV box is supposed to be right there, but every time I, you know, go up there, it's not. So where is it? It happens all the time. And it gets a little frustrating, but what we are seeing now with BIN is that there's more of a discipline of what that deliverable is supposed to be. 
we're still not over the hump. The data still is not as accurate as we want. But you, if, you, if you start to analyze how like a fire department is starting to use built environment information so that they can get an assessment done, saving seconds before they get to an event to a place they've never been before, it provides them a bit of an edge, hopefully to save your life. Oh, so this is the type way that we're starting to take a look at BIM in a different way. So what we did was that we went ahead and we, we wanted to create a multi-BIM environment because we felt that when you have buildings that have, uh, that, that have trusted data that are right across the street from another uh, asset, another building that has data that, that, that you trust, well, now you can start to create relationships. What's also cool is that we can actually go inside of the building as well and really start to get as-built to a point where it can start to help us. And one of those tools um, is called uh, Vim. And uh, this is a product that we use uh, for, uh, for identifying all the different assets on a data asset uh, way uh, to allow us now to do analysis, to do moves, add changes, to start really getting into the BAS systems that we've all spent a lot of money on, but now we can feed it real data. This is called the cyber physical relationship, meaning that every piece of data that you see inside of this Unity gaming engine is exactly where it is on the planet Earth. Also, all the product information, uh, you know, all of this stuff is embedded inside of this digital version or what we're calling the digital twin of what is in reality. That cyber-physical relationship, uh, many are calling uh, the, uh, the fourth age of the Industrial Revolution, where we've moved away from the information age, just gathering information, but now we have it in context. This is why when you start hearing uh, you know, organizations like Cisco and Schneider Electric and Siemens and all, the, you know, all of our friends, all of our vendors, when they start to talk, talk about the Internet of Things, this is where it actually makes sense in context of buildings, both inside the building and then the spaces between the building, because that's where the money is. Right now, you've just to put up sensors and have the internet of things in that context, it has no rhyme or reason. It does not have a value. So this is why this, uh, like this next stage of this collision of working with uh, our IT vendors and our IT colleagues and where that collision is happening with real estate becomes very exciting because they're now starting to see information like, like they've not seen it before. And we're now starting to see how we can control the data so that we can have a more efficient built environment. So that's Vim. Uh, it's been a, uh, uh, a very good tool for us. But where we really see the rubber meet in the road is when we can take a city like Atlanta and model it relatively quick uh, and be able to have uh, the ability to see all of the underground assets and all the above ground assets in a geospatially perfect environment, like what you're seeing here, uh, which is uh, done on our gaming engine. <clears throat> because once you have a geospatial way of placing assets, you're able then to, to interface with them. Uh, so many of you may have apps on your phone right now that can control things like turning lights on or off in your home, potentially. I know I do right now with AT&T, I have a, uh, a home alarm system. So, you know, halfway around the world, I could be turning lights on and off. I could be locking doors. I could be, you know, arming my, uh, you know, uh, uh, system, uh, all with the touch of a finger because I'm having that cyber physical relationship. The more and more as we start to get data and contextualize it, make our buildings quote unquote smart, I think the more opportunity there's going to be for us to have a more safe, a more secure and a, a environment for a higher quality of life. What we're doing with this particular uh, example here in Atlanta is just showing different pieces of data that can flow underneath the 3D ge geometry. And the 3D geometry can be very uh, uh, high level of detail, it can be low level of detail. It depends on what your app wants to do. That's what we're calling Orbi. It's this three dimensional way of looking at data that makes sense because the apps that you're going to be creating for like, let's say, measuring uh, energy, measuring traffic, measuring crime, uh, heat maps, all these different things that go into the city now are available to you. Uh, this is an open source, open code uh, uh, environment. Why? Because many municipalities, either existing or new ones, don't want to have proprietary uh, software anymore. You may want to have that as an authoring tool, but not for management. It has to be open. And that's where the data comes in. Because once you then can create the data inside of an open source world, uh, we also had to think about, well, how do we actually then make that data do something? And we chose JavaScript 
where you have a little over 40 million developers keeping your costs low so that you can actually pull the data up and create apps. This is the new world that we're looking at. A lot of free stuff out there uh, that's allowing people to make better informed decisions and hopefully getting the right measures in place so that you are raising the quality of life for either your, your customers, uh, your internal customers, and hopefully uh, you know the world at large. So that's, that's the basis of, of uh, you know, how we come up with our theories of how do we take an innovation and bring it forward into uh, a, you know, a high performance urban environment. Uh, why are we doing that? Well, because the majority of the world's population are all migrating to urban environments. But I also don't think that urban environments are going to be what we think they are. I'm sick and tired of seeing how Hollywood and the world of gaming paints the future like everything is dark, it's always raining, people are flying around in cars and, and, and they're shooting each other. Um, you know, Blade Runner is not the environment that I want to grow up in the future, right? Uh, or, or actually leave for our kids. Um, and I think that, you know, when you start to take a dystopian look at the future, you're being lazy, absolutely lazy. It's really, really easy to think all the bad things. It's more difficult to create not so much utopia and everyone's happy and you know it's a you know it's Legoland, uh, but where's the environment for the future where it is safer, it is more secure, and you do have a higher quality of life? And these are the measures that we're uh, that we're looking at now and measuring against others that have done some great work, uh, even inside the workplace. You know, how do you improve the quality of air? How do you improve the quality of light uh, without using as much energy and being sensitive to things like the environment? Now, I'm the farthest thing from a tree hugger, but uh, you know, I do follow uh, you know good design rules. Uh, you know, when I went to architectural school, we did not pat ourselves on the back for designing something to be sustainable. You were supposed to. How come we put you know you know the the uh, you know the uh, you know Superman seal of approval onto our buildings because wow, like we're sustainable is beyond me. I don't know where we got to get there. I'm very very pleased that that the general public was made aware of what we do from a value aspect. And that's one great thing I've seen with things like Green Building Council and Lead and all this other stuff. But, you know, I think we need to get over ourselves that we are supposed to protect the environment. We're supposed to leave it a better place than we, than we got there. So with that in mind, I want to show off a couple of projects uh, just to give an example of, 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 of what that means, where you know you don't need to grandstand to say that something's green. It should just be called good design. And that's what we're doing here in uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, our, where the good doctor is uh, this evening. Um, and uh, this is uh, in the northern suburbs of Jeddah, out uh, in an area called the Corniche, uh, which is up against uh, the Red Sea. Uh, so it's a very high water table. Uh, what you're seeing here are progress construction documents, uh, and, uh, photographs. Uh, uh, that were taken uh, just a, about a month or so ago on the right-hand side. Um, it's called Kingdom City. It's also now being rebranded and called uh, Jeddah Economic City. Uh, this is the world's uh, tallest building when complete. It'll be 259 stories tall. We're right now sitting at about 62, 63 stories up out of the ground. It'll be one kilometer tall when we're completed with it. It'll house 30,000 people in any 24-hour period on the average. It's a vertical city. Now, surrounding this city is is where we're having a lot of fun. And let me, pardon me here for a second. There we go. I, I want to show this video because what we designed was a city for 50,000 people that surrounds this tower. And uh, we feel like, like we were challenged uh, because uh, Kingdom City, a general economic city, uh, is a traditional horizontal city that is now has an iconic vertical city right smack in the middle of it. And our challenge was this, if we really wanted to put a lot of our innovations in place, we had to rethink what does the city look like. 125 years ago, there was a brand new innovation called the elevator, the lift, that fundamentally changed the shape of cities. What we're looking at right now is that autonomous vehicles are doing that for, for our cities. Um, it's, a, it's a new way of taking a look at blowing away the street grid because you don't need a street grid when you have an autonomous vehicle. You don't have no need, especially with piezoelectric, to stop. I mean, you have stops, but it's not you need a parking lot. Uh, so there's no parking lots. There's no stop signs. There's no traffic lights. What does that urban experience look like? So we experimented here uh, and have come up with simulations. Uh, this is now under construction. will be finished in 2022. Uh, with the world's first fully autonomous city, 
Uh, there will be no uh, cars allowed except, except for Prince Alawid, who's bankrolling this. Uh, and that main road you see right there that leads into the town, that's called Ferrari Way, so that he can drive his Ferrari to go to his building. So that's the one motorized vehicle that's allowed. Everything else is not. Uh, so it's a grand experiment to see what the effects are on humans. How do they interact in an autonomous world, especially when you're going into one of the world's largest shopping malls that's at the base of this tower, where there is no parking lot. So where's the entrance? You know, how do you move in and around, uh, you know, a covered city? Uh, and we've uh, gone through a number of different iterations on this. It's just, it's just been fascinating. Uh, what we've also found is that we are able to use our, our building information modeling for things like doing simulations. Uh, we've gone through extensive work uh, with our partners, uh, Bin Laden Group, um, out of Saudi Arabia, the largest contractor in the uh, Middle East, to figure out how to build a building that's never been done before. You know, how do you lift something up one kilometer tall uh, in very, very harsh conditions, both cold, wind, and heat? Um, and it was a remarkable exercise to go through that, that the cyber equivalent of what's being done digitally has already been built. It's called virtual design and construction. The other thing that's uh, remar remarkable uh, create a DC powered only city, not losing all of that energy and resource of having to transfer that into AC just to transmit power. Uh, there is no AC current necessary in this city. Um, it's all DC powered because the local areas are their own power plant and power generation. So it's, if this was our first smart city. Uh, we felt like we did a good job. Um, it's now coming up out of the ground. But we had one big problem, and it's probably something that uh, you're all experiencing as well, especially if you are working on capital projects anywhere in the world today, is the lack of labor. Um, 2008 to 2010 recession really, really crippled uh, the design and construction industry <clears throat> to the point where we are being forced to use things like robotics, not because it's cool and drones and all these innovations, not because it's cool and looks good and it, you know, at an IFMA, you know, webinar. We're, we have to use these tools because we don't have enough people to build our buildings. So it's funny how the market now is forcing the stodgy old, you know, design and construction industry and the real estate world to conform and to start to do things that other industries went through you know, upwards of 20, 30, 40 years ago. So it's happened, and I think that's the good news. Uh, the, the, what we had to do, though, was now to start to take a look at our city in Saudi Arabia and say, well, we don't have enough people to build it, so what are we going to do? What you're seeing is a uh, video on the left-hand side of our factory in Shanghai, China. Uh, we are now creating what you see on the right-hand side, which is one example from about 12 different layouts of a uh, 2,500 square foot or 200, approximately 250 square meter residence home, single family home. Uh, these are being manufactured uh, in knockdown uh, fashion. Uh, they're done as panels, uh, so they're, they're wall panels, uh, but we can also create floors and ceilings and things like that. Uh, what you're seeing on the right-hand side, that type of model, uh, we're pumping out fully finished, ready to go in seven minutes. 2,500 square foot home, 250 square meter home in seven minutes with zero defects and almost zero waste. It's a remarkable way of how now we're starting to see the manufacturing processes entering the world of, of design and construction, which means that facility managers are going to need to really get their heads and their thoughts into these types of practices. Because the way that we work with this particular house manufacturing process is that we have a 40 foot long, uh, maximum 40 foot long uh, wall system, and it's a structural system. Uh, it's, uh, we use what's called CLT or cross laminated timber, where at 90 degrees we take the different uh, wood uh, fibers and grains and go at 90 degree angles and we use a compression uh, uh, technology that uh, that sears these uh, th these elements together. Of course, we have insulation and other types of things inside these walls. But then what happens is we have a configurator that takes these 12 different types of models with different types of windows, different types of doors, that type of thing, that allows these machines that you see these three guys, uh, you know, uh, uh, riding and, and, and maintaining. Uh, these are the largest CNC machines in the world that cut and route out all those fenestrations. It also does something very interesting in the wall is that it creates conduit, and the conduits are meant for things like you know power, electrical, uh, water, plumbing, and mechanical. 
but we also have a fourth utility. It's called information communications technology. We put fiber into the walls to create intelligence. So literally what we're doing is we're creating motherboards inside of our housing for Saudi Arabia so that when you bring out these different panels to the site and you snap them together, it takes about a week to put together a 2,500 square foot home. Once that's done, you've now created our version of Alexa. You know how Amazon has this thing called Alexa and they put out, you know, uh, it, it can help learn, uh, you know, your habits, what type of music you like, what type of mood, uh, you know, lighting you want. I believe Google Home has one as well. Uh, and they're all starting to talk to you and have a personality. Well, we don't have Alexa that sits on a counter. The, the house is actually like Alexa. Uh, it's intelligent. Um, it's being used uh, to, for, again, safety first, uh, security and a higher quality of life. And what happens is when you connect these homes together, they start to connect in a way that we call the internet of buildings. For safety, for security, for being able to judge if one uh, home is not using as much uh, you know, power, can one home uh, transact where another home may be having a party and they need more power. Instead of going out to the grid, you can actually start to exchange on a district level, even down to a home to home level. So very, very interesting things that were that, that's being experimented with. Um, I think that the remarkable piece of this is that we're trying to keep this as low as possible when it comes to uh, cost. Uh, right now, this 250 square meter home is 250,000 US dollars installed. So it's a really interesting way now of starting to take capital expenditures, capital delivery, and start to compress those time scales so that we can meet the needs, not just of the rich people of the world with homes, but for everyone. This actually leads us to uh, a remarkable project that uh, was thrust upon us uh, just about a month ago. Uh, the city of Nashville, Tennessee had a referendum vote uh, about a week ago Tuesday, two weeks ago Tuesday, two, uh, two weeks ago, yeah, okay, it's Wednesday, sorry, <laughs> my jet lag's kicking. So two weeks ago yesterday, there was a big vote. <laughs> the original, there's a transportation issue inside of Nashville that needed to be addressed. Um, the uh, There was a lot of time and effort put in uh, by the city council and the former mayor and other city leaders. And what they came up with was the probably the best result for its time was to create a, uh, a plan, a transit plan, that would take a lot of the uh, traffic that goes right through downtown uh, Nashville through interstates and things like that and put it underground. That's, you know, I guess that's a solution. Uh, and then on, on the surface uh, streets, they wanted to put in a light rail system. Now there's plenty of cities that have done that. They're not working too well. I mean, they're okay, but for the needs of what you want, which is getting people from the suburbs into the central city, they never solved that problem. And they put a price tag of about $9 billion on this that will raise the taxes for everyone in Nashville to be the, I believe, the, the most taxed, highest taxed uh, uh, city in, in all the United States. So we came up with a different proposal and said, what would happen if we didn't have to put that infrastructure in like rail and start using American injury, American products, American services that can then be turned into something of an asset. And that's where we pulled together our recipe uh, to come up with uh, these, uh, these autonomous buses. Uh, so the Nashville MTA uh, has been uh, you know, uh, cheering us on with what this is. This is a 20 meter bus coming in from all the different suburbs. This is uh, something for existing cities uh, that can help with dedicated lanes uh, for autonomous vehicles that can help with with uh, taking cars off the roads. Uh, this is a scheduled bus. It looks like a train. Uh, it just runs on wheels uh, and actually does not need turning radiuses because the wheels can actually turn at 90 degrees. So it's a much different way of looking at mass transportation. Uh, we also have a 12 meter bus, uh, you know, very typical to what uh, you see every day in your cities, uh, except that these also are on scheduled stops. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, when we know exactly how far uh, you know, every stop is, we can calculate how much excess energy we're creating. Now, the other cool thing that we're doing here for revenue is that we're working with the largest branding and advertising company in the world called Denso Aegis Network. And the interior of these particular buses are going to be interactive. 
Uh, it also means that you need an app on your device, whatever that device is, it could be a watch, it could be a phone, it's whatever the next thing is going to be. There will be an app for you to actually get onto the bus. And what it does, it takes very, very high level demographics, you know, about male, female, uh, you know, uh, first name, you know, things like that, not too invasive of privacy. But what that does is that it goes up to the cloud where the Internet Agents Network has a brokering system called flash brokering. Uh, it's very, very fast where we can take that 10G up and down LED light thing and actually have the person, by the time that they even step on the bus, there's an auction going off to, to, to for her demographic that the different advertisers then are bidding about who's going to get the chance to advertise to her for an experience. And so what happens is uh, when you get on the bus, you, you're, you're really going to be hit with, uh, you know, please watch this 30 second video or download the app of this advertiser for you to get free power, right? So wirelessly charging your phone or whatever device you have, and also uh, uh, free internet access. So that's the way that we're starting to make uh, some business sense about all of this and keep things free or as low cost as possible um, while maintaining a healthy profit margin. Uh, the the non-tax-based revenue on this is 1.35 million U.S. dollars per bus. Now, here's the real kicker. Let's get to the two-meter bus. This is the last mile. Usually with public transportation, you usually go to a terminal, you go to a bus stop, and then you got to still go somewhere, right, to your place of work, or shopping, or going home. We're taking the Uber and Lyft model, and we're taking that to the two-meter bus that will get you right to where you need to be. And also for, for large-scale events, you can imagine an army you know, an armada of these two-meter buses, <coughs> taking people to and from sporting events and entertainment events, and they always have that in, in uh, uh, you know, in, in downtown Nashville, especially on a weekend. Uh, you know, so we're looking at this now as not just being a, a way of getting from point A to point B, but also being part of the experience, meaning that the interior of this particular vehicle can be uh, used to entertain, it can be used for education. There's many different things through augmented reality that we can project into this unit that makes it not a self-driving car. We went into this industry, the, the automotive industry, with our eyes wide open. We wanted to partner with whoever was going to do a great thing by really rethinking what public transportation and what transportation is inside of a city. So what we've done is we did a really good uh, you know, analysis and visited up you know, with our friends at Tesla and Google and General Motors and you know, just all these different groups. And I'm here to tell you they're all doing it wrong. They're part of the problem. They're not part of the solution. And the reason why is because they're still thinking things of self-driving cars. They don't mind having hybrid environments on the road. They don't mind that LiDAR and GPS kind of sort of work and they're putting people's lives in danger. That's not acceptable to us. So we went ahead and we designed these units. Uh, we are now uh, engineering uh, and will be in full production by September with our designers in Milan and Turin, Italy, uh, with the same people that gave us the Lamborghini, the Ferrari, and the Alfa Romeo. They are now going to be bringing us the new form of transportation that is going to uh, take one of the largest cities, uh, high growth cities in the United States and, and reposition it forever. So we're really proud about how smart cities now are going to be affecting things. But here's where facility management people need to start, again, getting their, getting their ideas into this process. We're creating moving real estate. That's what, we're, these, that's what this, these are. These are, these are moving pieces of real estate that bring your experience and extend it out from point to point. So instead of going to a Starbucks, how about the Starbucks pod comes to pick you up? Um, what happens with healthcare when you're sick? Why go to a doctor's office to sit, you know, in a waiting room with other sick people when, when the, uh, you know, when the doctor's pod can come and connect into your facility? Uh, what happens with, you know, being lazy one night and but you really want to go out to dinner with your favorite, to your favorite restaurant? But your favorite restaurant can come to you with the sous chef and the chef and plug into your living room. What does that look like, aesthetically? What does that do to process? What does that do, do through moving through space, especially in a dense? urban environment type of way. These are challenges. Uh, you know, we're actually now rethinking how you enter a building. You know, I mentioned about the shopping mall, where most shopping malls, either you park underneath, above, or around a shopping mall, and there's entrances. Where's the front entrance when there's no need to have, uh, you know, a, a parking area?
Um, what happens when it's 9 o'clock a.m. or it's 5 p.m. and you have a rush of workers coming in and out of, of, of the facility? Do these two meter buses all queue up and you go one by one? Or are we looking at a new way of entering commercial office space that looks more like a gate arrangement at an airport? We don't know yet. And we're, and we're going through a lot of different processes in order to figure this out. And it's a fascinating time to redefine buildings and redefine that urban experience. Um, you'll see here in downtown Nashville that we also have very specific roads that are gonna be autonomous vehicle only. What we've learned is that hybrid versions do not work and they're dangerous. Um, having a dedicated lane system actually uh, helps in a lot of different ways with discipline, that type of thing. Just go to New York where you know there's one way this way, one way that way. People haven't learned that over time. There's always chaos. Like look at, you know, even, even in Brooklyn, I mean, it was always chaotic. No one really had a discipline in place until they said, we're going to do it this way, which is why in Brooklyn, uh, you know, you're constantly dodging away from everything, which is why the baseball team is called the Brooklyn Dodgers, <laughs> right? So we're, we're learning from, from, you know, from the past. Uh, the cool part about this as well is that we learned about the hub and spoke does work, but we have to keep it flexible. So is why that green patch you see over there is actually going to be the quote unquote Grand Central Terminal for autonomous vehicles and will look something like this. Clean, green, beautiful, um, again, improving quality of life for people so that, uh, you know, we, we have all the tools and we just have to put it together in the right recipe. So one last thing that I'd like to uh, explore with you as we close out um, is how different buildings now are, are, are being challenged as to what is their purpose? And one of them is a project that we announced and signed uh, with President Trump. Uh, about, we joined him and, uh, and, uh, and the administration on a trip to Beijing this past November. Uh, and we signed agreements to create the world's first virtual reality industrial park that also includes a theme park. We're calling it DREAM. Uh, this is a different type of way of taking a look at how you can start to incubate innovation in a city within a city approach meaning that this 90 acre site that we're creating this industrial park uh, for the uh, exploration of, of R&D for virtual reality, augmented reality and mixed reality. Some people call it hyper reality, all these different you know, ways of experience data uh, in, a, in a simulated environment that has the cyber physical relationship, allows us to bring innovation into our, our uh, industrial park before we scale it into the rest of the city and the city is known as Qingdao. Uh, you may recognize the name Qingdao is actually a name of a very famous uh, uh, Chinese beer, uh, but it, uh, and, and the brewery is there, but it's also known as one of the most picturesque and beautiful cities in all of China. It's on the coast, on the east coast of China, uh, south of Beijing, north of Shanghai, uh, and uh, they were looking for uh, a solution that would help them with bringing people in beyond the summertime months, because that's really where they get a lot of their economy from, is from tourism. They wanted to break that into a 12 month experience, and this seemed to fit the bill. Um, what we're doing is creating uh, R&D labs and incubating labs, not just for games and uh, you know, uh, you know, VR experiences and Hollywood and TV and entertainment, which of course we're doing that, but what we are doing um, is also then inviting in how these types of technologies affect things like, well, uh, you know, the design and construction industry. Uh, how does it affect healthcare? How does it affect surgery? How does it affect, uh, you know, real estate? And these things need to be explored. So we're creating content based upon that to be both a business themed environment and also a gaming entertainment themed environment. It's the first time it's being tried like this. We're having a ball. Uh, we do have uh, some of the people from Walt Disney Engineering that put up Shanghai Disney on our team that are assisting us, guiding us on how to do this properly. Uh, but the cool part about this is where we're now moving into things like e-travel. Uh, for people in China that would come to visit this particular uh, uh, facility, um, we're going to be creating environments for you to binge travel. You know, instead of watching Breaking Bad for the 15th time one weekend, have it take your family out, put on some VR glasses and go to the Louvre or go to the Grand Canyon because you may not, you may not ever get there physically, but we can actually simulate that because it's not just the visual. We have audio that goes with it. We have the ability to, to, to make it hot, cold, wet, dry. So all the senses are being tapped when you come to this particular environment. Uh, the business models we have are interesting. Uh, we are basing it upon the uh, uh, the model of the World's Fair, the World Expo, 
uh, where each one of the pavilions uh, will be Samsung, Microsoft, HTC, Facebook, Google. And it's going to be a, a way of showcasing the next and greatest uh, you know, wave of technology like we've never seen before, which is this uh, you know, artificial experience. And uh, there's a lot of eyeballs on this project, uh, obviously, but this is what it means for FMs. Um, <clears throat> the majority of these facilities, these pavilions, are not finished on the inside. And I'll show you what that looks like. So this is friends of ours um, out of uh, out of oh, here we go out of Utah uh, that uh, can, can really help explain what what we're doing here. Um, it's called the Void, but what what what's interesting is take a look at what the interior of these pavilions look like when you when you have the VR goggles on. So the idea is that if you have an unfinished space, you can then map like what this uh, young lady is doing, any type of experience you want. You want it to be about fairies, you want it to be about dragons, you want it to be about walking down the street in New York City. Maybe you want to play a superhero, and you can do things like this. So it's this way of creating a different uh, plane of experience that will challenge folks, quite frankly. We're looking right now at VR and AR as being one of the greatest tools for simulation for training. Uh, for being able to use it for education, uh, you know, moving beyond the book and actually being in the experience. Uh, for the ideas of entertainment, uh, you know, you can see it looks like a blank, but on here, this is really what you're doing. But what's also cool is that, and it's a bit of a challenge, is that as opposed to a traditional theme park where you have a ride that you know lasts about four minutes, there's a line that usually takes about a half hour to get through that's also part of the ride. So that's 34 minutes, and then you usually come out of that four-minute ride into some sort of retail establishment themed around that ride. It's a brilliant model, right, because you're constantly there, but it's also great for crowd control because we know how long you're going to stay inside of that particular ride or that particular experience. In VR, we can create certain rides that will only be four minutes long, but for the most part, these are experiences that never end. It's like the never-ending movie where you could be the hero. You could be a person that's a spectator watching. You could be the bad guy, depending on how you want to react, either with your friends in a multiplayer environment or by yourself. Um, so it's a really interesting uh, way of taking the interior and the operation of the facility and mapping things that people haven't even thought of yet. So these are, you know, th this is how we're taking a look at the future, um, uh, where we're going to be challenged uh, by a lot of different things. Right now we're challenged <laughs> by, uh, you know, socioeconomic issues such as trade wars, but we're working through that. Um, we, you know, when you're on a project like this, it's nice to have the U.S. government, these are officials from the U.S. Embassy in Beijing, coming down to check out our site and seeing how they can help. There's a lot of really good will with all of these different smart cities projects. They're important, uh, but really at the end of the day, what we're looking at is having people have hope uh, it, we don't have to live in Blade Runner in the future. And no, technology is not smart cities. It's about experience. It's about innovation. And we do need the help of the people in the facility management profession to have a voice at the table. Thank you very much. And I'll hand this back over to Bob. Thank you. Thank you all for the informative uh, presentation. Uh, I've got your some questions. Let's have a look. When we create digital twins of a built environment and its processes, we will be confronted with a host of opportunities not seen before and attendant financial consideration. What are your thoughts about how facility management is looking at financial management of operation and maintenance? In this slide? Great question. I think that when you have the ability to implement innovation, it was always seen as a cost center. Uh, we're now at a point where we're looking at innovations that traditional cost centers can be revenue generators. When you start to take a look at the, at, at the movement of power between buildings, from a building to a grid, that's a different type of relationship from being just a user on the demand side of things. When the building starts to become the, the, the power generation deal, that changes the relationship. It means you're a partner, you're not just a customer to the local power companies. That's a very interesting relationship that FM should really think about. The financial management of that then 
pulls into looking at the operations and maintenance of the facility like a business plan. I think that having business plans are very important. And then as different uh, you know, innovations are discovered, uh, because we're right now in this un unbelievable time of, of newness. So that discovery process means we should have a business plan that's flexible enough so that we are not making capital uh, expenditures on, you know, uh, on, on, on innovations that may have a very short shelf life which means your financial management needs to be, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it needs to have that base of the business plan to have that flexibility to understand what, what is built in obsolescence for a lot of these things or what's the next thing. Um, and then we have to take a look at the buildings themselves. I, I was in uh, Ottawa, Canada, talking with uh, the public works officials uh, yesterday. Um, and they are, they are, they're doing some fascinating things with performance and and, and, and utilization numbers, uh, you know, in their government buildings, their utilization at its highest is 42% during a workday. 42% of that building is being used when the other almost 60% is not. What can we do to take the value of what has been created? And is it an office still? What can it be? You know, they, you know, they, they have some great ideas about pulling in like incubators and, and, and taking entrepreneurs and having them co-locate Really co-locate almost what begins like we work. Sorry. So I think that right now the idea of financial management has to has to be part of a foundation of an overall business plan of what your buildings want to be. Yeah, great. Uh, any other questions? Um, can we move all to the end of the presentation? I have to conclude some recommendation to our attendees. Yes, CD, I believe you have control. Yes, um, I just wanted to um, thank everyone uh, for attending the webinar today. Um, please note that we do have a couple more webinar sessions um, going on to enjoy throughout World FM Day today. Um, also, be sure to visit IFMA's new and exclusive member value page to explore um, more opportunities with, as IFMA members. Um, I would like to thank Mohammed and Paul for joining us today. Everyone have a great day. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. Thank you, Zidi. Thank you.